The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Well, hello and welcome to the Veterans Forum. This program is coming to the studios of Access Television here in Nashua, New Hampshire. Today is the 10th of July, the year 2014. As is usually the case, we have another young fellow here who did his thing way back then, who would like to come and share some of those experiences with us. And we ask everybody here, every guy and gal, no matter what branch you served in, if you can, and will come and share those experiences in a recorded interview. You'll get a copy of the program for your own use, but more important, I think you'll find that it helps answer the questions a lot of guys and gals are asked. Hey, grandpa or grammy or brother or son, what did you do in the war? This is a good way of answering it, and it'll become the best legacy that you can leave your family. And we're not going to live forever, but this little thing will make it a lot more enjoyable for people when we're no longer here to talk. That's the bottom line. If you don't talk, tell your story, nobody else will, and we've lost all that history. Now, before we start today's show with Al, I'd like to remind you of something I got a couple of weeks ago as a reminder from the VA. There's a special telephone system number 211 that if any guy or gal, or even the friend or family of some veteran, who feels he or she needs some help, call that number, 211, and it'll be set up in keeping with a cadre of all kinds of help and people that'll hopefully answer your needs and give you what you need. But you have got to call and ask for it. They will not give it to you automatically. So much for that. Today is a wonderful story, I think. Each one is different. We all had the same aim to do our job. I'll ask Hal to introduce himself. We'll take the story from there. Young man, we welcome you, and we're on. If you will, tell us your full name, spell your last name for the record, give us where you now live, and your service dates, if you okay. will, and the branch of service. There we go. Yes, sir. Well, Bob, my name is Harold Hal. I like to be called Hal Mahar. It's spelled M-A-H-A-R. I live in Nashua, New Hampshire, at 30 Mercury Lane, I served in the United States Army from 1964 to 1969. And I can't remember what the rest of your, your questions were. There wasn't much more. We've taken care of all I of them. love it. I <laughs> love it. Thank no, you. No, seriously. Uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to do, now we kind of find out who we are right now. Let's go back and find out what it took to get you here. For example, where and when were you born? What was your family life growing up as a child? Anything special or outstanding that you'd like to share with us, good or bad, that gives us a clue as to who you really are? I was born in, uh, on a winter, winter morning, February 11th, 1943, at the North Conway Hospital. And uh, I'm in lucky New enough Hampshire? to have, yes, sir, North oh, Conway, New Hampshire. Hampshire. Oh, New Hampshire. <laughs> hey, uh, all the way in New Hampshire. And, uh, and for a long time, I had the length record at the North Conway Hospital. I was 24 and a half inches long. Wow. I looked like a little bird. I've seen some pictures, and it's just uh, arms and legs and, a, and, and the Mahar beak here, this uh -huh. nose. But uh, it, it, it was such a joy to grow up uh, with the Conway Valley. I had a great-grandmother who was born in 1876 who lived at the end of North Road, and everybody knew uh, Nellie Toll, and uh, she was everybody's grandmother. It was oh. just, uh, just neat just right there at the beginning of the Kangamagas Highway. Watch your language. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. That's Indian, I think. I know. And how about your family? Like, do you have any brothers or sisters? That sort of thing. Yes, sir. I, 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 I have a brother, and uh, my brother was uh, part of the United States Marine Corps, uh, Robert Ralph Mahar, and uh, two years younger than I am. And I've got to tell you that uh, he, was, he was a very crafty young man. I can remember growing up, I was... Uh, 12 years old and shoveling our driveway in Bow, New Hampshire, and uh, I asked my mom if my brother could come and help me. He was 10. She said, no, no, he's too young. 
So two years later, I'm 14, and, and he's 12 now, of course. And okay. I'm shoveling that same driveway, and I asked her if he could come and help. And uh, She said, no, no, he's too young. So I understood from the beginning. Well, about 20 years ago, maybe, maybe just 10 years ago, say I'm 71, so yeah, about 10 years ago, my brother called me. They had a terrible snowstorm in North Andover, New Hampshire. Terrible snowstorm. He called me up and he said, brother, I'd like you to come up here and shovel my driveway. I'm too young. He was just a, just a good man, you know, just <laughs> solid throughout his entire life. <laughs> and you were too old to do it. So That's right. Home. I was too old to go. That, yes, sir. That, that'll learn him. Huh? <laughs> that'll now, learn how him. was life growing up and going to school? What did you do to keep busy and active and productive? My dad was in the service, so uh, we spent the first uh, 12 Which years going anymore? all around. The, he was in the United States Army. Oh. And uh, he had gotten out of the service after World War II. He served with the 3rd Infantry Division in Europe. And uh, he went back in, and we, uh, we, we lived in uh, Japan, lived in uh, Greece. We lived at Fort Myer, Virginia. He was in the old guard. And uh, he contracted multiple sclerosis while we were on duty in, in uh, Greece, and uh, he was medically retired. So growing up, I was, an, I was an Army brat. Army brat. Yes, sir. Spent very little time anywhere and, oh. uh, and a little bit of time everywhere. Did you have a lot of friends or just acquaintances going from post to post? I, I would say, honestly, friends everywhere. And uh, I, I know that there's a, a saying that says some people come into your life for a moment and some for a season and some for a lifetime. I can tell you, Bob, that uh, you're now in my life for a lifetime. Oh, well, you're in trouble. I, I, I just, uh, well, you're 91 years old, and I figure sooner or later we'll meet on the other side. <laughs> yeah, but you're too young to make that statement. <laughs> yes, sir. At 71, I am. But I'm not going to 91. Okay. No, sir. I hope you do have a good time. We did. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, when we were talking at the beginning, uh, you indicated that uh, you were a recipient of a good present a full vote to go to the Citadel. Could you explain what and how you got that and what impact they may have had on your life as far as you getting ready to go in the service? Yes, sir, and, and I don't want to misrepresent it. What I did was I had a you know, partial scholarship to go okay. to uh, the Citadel and, a, and an aunt who really was not an aunt who sponsored me for the balance of that. And I uh, went to the Citadel in 1960, right out of Concord High School, 17 years old, and uh, four years later I uh, graduated and as I walked across the stage and saluted the president of the Citadel, General Mark Waring Clark. Uh, he uh, told me that I was a distinguished military graduate and he would uh, guarantee my first choice of duty. Wow. And so I put down, I wanted to go to the 82nd Airborne Division in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Now for a man who's afraid of heights, the last <laughs> thing he wants to do is go to an airborne outfit and jump out of perfectly good airplanes. You'd be surprised how many times I've had just the opposite. Some guy in an airplane looking down to submariner saying, what dummy wants to be locked up in a tin can? And he's looking up there, what idiot wants to jump out of a good plane? That's There's right. There's nobody happier in either direction. <laughs> That's right. Well, you're being a CB, Bob. I would never go in a ship because there's no place to hide. At least in the infantry, you can dig in the ground. And yeah, if who, you... who wants to be a mud rat? Oh, no. listen, I'll tell you, you can get down, pull that helmet right down over your head just you like your you're a turtle. Take your buckle off so that you get even further yeah. down. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. There. Yes, sir. All right. Now, when you go through the Citadel, did you get your wish? And when and how did you enter the service? What day and where did you report? But more important, how did you get there? What did you feel like when you got there the first day or two? Okay, I, I really want to take you back probably to uh, 1949 on a hill called Mars Hill outside of Athens, Greece. And it was uh, an Easter Sunday morning and that chaplain was giving the sunrise service. And my dad was there in his class A's and two of his good buddies were there. And they had bloused combat boots. And they had a, a hat like, like my hat here, mm -hmm. this overseas hat with a glider patch and a parachute. And from that moment on, I said, I want to be a paratrooper. And the two of them said, well, what you want to do is you understand, young man, that right now you're standing, that little, that little marker right there is where Paul stood and spoke to the Athenians about Jesus Christ. He said, if you really want to be a paratrooper, you want to pray about it. And I can tell you every time I jumped out of that plane, He's I prayed because yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Just open it. Let me go one more time. Let me go one more time. So we it started it. really in 1949 and in 1964, I went to uh, jump school at Fort Benning. Okay. And uh, I, I, I promise you that uh, first four or five times I jumped out of the plane, I never remember 
leaving the aircraft. I tell people honestly that I jumped 32 times and every jump was a night jump and a water landing. And people look at me and they say, really, it's dangerous jumping in water, but you jumped at night. I said, yes, every time I jumped, I closed my eyes and <laughs> wet my pants. We don't have to go there. <laughs> That's why you had balloon pants to keep them against the that's, that's why, your, that's why yeah. your, your boots were bloused. Yeah. And I, I, I got to tell you, it was, it was sheer economics, really. Uh, I, I, I go back to uh, how impressed I was with those paratroopers that were my dad's buddies. But when I got out of school, a second lieutenant with under two years of service made $222.30 a month base pay. Jump pay was $110 a month. That's a 50% pay raise. I know. So I researched it. I, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm at the Citadel on scholarship. I researched it, and regulation said you only have to fall out of that airplane four times a year to maintain your jump status. So I'm going off to the 82nd Airborne Division. I didn't realize that they don't maintain their jump status. They jump every week. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but for a 50% pay raise, okay. I'll, I'll close my eyes and wet my pants. Uh, before we leave, Greg, though, can you give us some idea what life was like? For example, when you first got in there, how did you feel? What was it, the, the, the boot camp routine? What were you subjected to? Were the instructors like the old Hollywood guys, real rough and uh, a little bit crude, or were they more polite, saying, would you please do this, would you please do that? Oh, there was, there was never never any of that please. It was always a command, but uh, but I grew up knowing how to do an about okay. face you, you and, a, jump and a right face. I really did, and yeah. and so I knew what to expect, and I, I knew how to sing cadence songs, and, and I knew I was going to be driven right to the uh, right to the limit of my physical capability. So uh, I, I, I actually relished it. Um, I looked forward to it. Uh, uh, we had a, a a tougher, I think, a tougher plebe orientation in 1960 than I did at any of the uh, training that I went, except maybe jungle warfare school down in the Canal Zone. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it would be a good thing for our young men today to go to basic training. It to go seems to, to be uh, a pretty universal thought. No matter what you're going to do, it learns you how to grow up real quick, but be responsive and responsible. Yes, sir. I, I'm, I'm sermonizing, but uh, oh, that's that seems that's to good. Be the yes, main. sir. It, it's so important to understand you're responsible for yourself, and what you do affects those yeah. around you. And, and so be you better pull on the rope in the same direction. Amen. Amen. Okay, we have a lot of ground to cover, so I'd like to find out when you left uh, jump school, what were you qualified to do as far as your training? In any special arms? Any special MOS? Radio? Uh, Pathfinder or whatever. So first of all, basically as an infantryman, I was the prime mover for a rifle. But I also had uh, the, the opportunity to go to a 4.2 inch mortar school. So they're the, uh, the heavy mortars of, uh, of an infantry battalion. And so uh, I came back from jump school and was the uh, mortar platoon commander, the platoon leader. And uh, when the 82nd Airborne Division was sent down to the Dominican Republic by President Johnson for a for a revolution down there, I took the 4.2-inch uh, mortars down there. We, we never did fire high explosives, but we did uh, fire some illuminating rounds until they were afraid that the canister that came off the illuminating round might fall down and hurt somebody. Meanwhile, we're shooting at one another, but those are the rules of engagement. Now, and, we, uh, we are friendly fire, or you and somebody else that wasn't friendly? Oh, we, said, they, they, we are shooting at each other. We're, we're shooting at each other. We were down there uh, to separate... Uh, Oh, there were rebels, and then there was the National Army. And all I can tell you is that the Dominicans were delighted to see us there if we could separate the two. Because it seemed like when the rebels went through, they took all of the money. And when the National Army went through checking, chasing the rebels, they took everything that could be turned into money. So they were just <laughs> happy to see someone there Everybody with the United States Army way. uniform. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But, it was, uh, it was, but, but it's, I came out of the Dominican Republic with a combat infantryman's badge. So oh. I, I, I'd, I'd been in war. Yeah. So, so I you got, came back. That's the best. Yeah, part. Oh yes, sir. Yes. And and I got back and uh, I volunteered to go over to uh, to Vietnam. Okay. So I already had combat experience and I I, I knew that there were some times in which it was uh, hard to breathe and I, I wouldn't have been able to pass gas even if I had eaten beans. But <laughs> I, I, you know I said I'll I'll get uh, I'll get this tour to Vietnam over. And besides, I want to make sure that, that I get to that first airborne outfit that went into uh, Vietnam. I'm going to volunteer for the 173rd Airborne Brigade. Okay. I get into country, and the man uh, goes through and he says, uh, we need replacements 
that I, maybe it was the 1st Infantry Division or the 25th Infantry Division. Or I said, no, sir, I volunteered for the 173rd Airborne Brigade. They said, well, Lieutenant, I was first lieutenant at the time. He said, well, Lieutenant, you have to go where the Army needs you. And I said, well, if the Army needs me there, they need to send me back home and bring me back on another set of orders. You'll notice that I'm a volunteer, and this order says that yeah, I'm going to the 173rd contract. Airborne Brigade, mm -hmm. and that's where I'm going. I'm not getting on a bus anywhere else. He looked at me and he said, uh, how long have you been in the service? I said I was born to somebody who was in the service. He was in the United States Infantry in the 3rd Infantry Division. And I'm telling you, I'm going to 173rd Airborne Brigade. He looked at me in the eyes and he said, well, sir, that bus will be leaving at 1,300 hours this afternoon. I went to 173rd Airborne Brigade. <laughs> so a little persuasion. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. I just, I, I just wasn't going to volunteer for something I didn't volunteer for. I know. I know. Now, when you got settled in, where did you report? And then I, what I'd like to do is have you give us some, if you will, stories or recounting of what you were trained to do and then your different types of... Uh, I'll say patrols, when you had to go out into the bush for how long and why, and without solving any uh, security stuff, because I don't want you to tell me something you have to kill me for. All right, sir. I'm that's that's, that's good. That. Yes, okay. sir. That's good. It's your life. I want to find out. Yes, sir. I, I'm pointing folks to some of the best fruit salads you'll ever see in my book. Uh, it didn't get handed to you. You had to go out and get it. But I'd like to tell you, if you will, how we can work into that. It's up to you. All right, sir. When I first got there, the unit was out in the field. They were in war zone D. Benoit, Vietnam. Okay. Got to our base like camp. And, up, yeah, that's good. Got to base <clears throat> camp in Benoit, Vietnam, and my battalion is out in war zone D. And so there's a couple of us that are going to go out as replacements. Jimmy Mosden from Claremont, New Hampshire, and Hal Mahar from Bowen, New Hampshire, are replacements, lieutenants, going back out. And they said, the, the operation's all over. You can go join the battalion and come back in with them. So we got on a helicopter, and we're on our way in, and, and we see these guys coming back out that are all wounded. And uh, it's getting a little bit real now. I didn't mm -hmm. see that many people wounded in the Dominican Republic. We get on the ground, but uh, they've got a battalion defensive perimeter, and uh, they brought in some hot chow that night by helicopter. I said, this is, this is not bad. My first night, I got... 364 now, more to go. Or, or just a good Oh, just a, a nice, nice LZ. Everything was uh, just, uh, you know, sort of like a walk in the woods. Oh. And then the sun <clears> went down. <throat> and that night, 2nd Battalion, 503rd Airborne Infantry, got a presidential unit citation. A North Vietnamese regiment tried to overrun us. And I'll tell you, all I was was a replacement. I couldn't get on the front line. I did know how to dig a prone shelter. And I got out my entrenching stool and started digging. And I dug and I dug and I dug. When I was in the Dominican Republic, I never had indirect fire. It was always somebody shooting directly at me, never indirect fire. And all of a sudden, we're getting indirect fire. And you hear them coming in. And you start to know, oh, that one's getting closer. Oh, mm -hmm. that one's getting closer. And I dig a little bit harder, dig a little bit harder. The only person I had to take care of was myself. Yeah. I was replacement. I hadn't met the guy I was replacing yet. So I'm digging just like, and I hear one coming in, and I said, Lord, that's got my name on it. I got down in the front of the corner of that foxhole and pulled my helmet down over it, and it just, incredible explosion. I think it's responsible for these hearing aids. Incredible explosion. And boy, I'll tell you, my backside hurt something terrible. So the indirect fire stopped, but the, the fire along the, the defensive perimeter is, is you, you can't even hear individual Gunshots, it's, it's just a, a, a hum going just on. Just cacophony. Yes. And, and cacophony would be a great word for it. Just, you know, just you cannot distinguish any individual boy. And I, just my back hurt. I put my hand down inside the back of my pants, and I'll tell you, it was just so wet. And I said, Lord, I haven't jumped out of an airplane, so I, not, I, know, it's, I know it's not one of those water landings. I, my, oh, my backside hurts awful. And I noticed over to my left, about 25 meters away, a red filtered flashlight. And uh, someone was answering the call to medic. Medic, yeah. So I, I, I crawled out of my, uh, my, uh, my foxhole and, and crawled over there to where this medic was. And there was a young paratrooper that was missing the entire cheek of his buttocks. And I put my hand back down there in my pants. And the only hole I could feel 
was the one that God gave me. So oh. I went back into my hole and I started digging again. And the next day, we, we survived. We, we did very, very well in that attack. But the next morning, they had to lower a rope down to get me out. I was digging all the way through to get to California. Chinese when they they, found you. Yes, sir. I was digging just <laughs> like you wouldn't believe. And, and what, had, what had happened is that that uh, projectile, mortar shell or 75 millimeter pack howitzer or whatever, had come in and exploded in the top of the jungle canopy. And the expended uh, shrapnel had come down and burned a hole through my jungle fatigues. And I had, of course, uh, shrapnel in my cheeks, but I had a terrible, terrible burn in, in my buttocks. Mm -hmm. And that's the yeah. part that hurt so you bad. Had a hot but, fanny. But, but yes, sir. So the only thing that was wet back there was, was just perspiration. But okay. that, uh, that was my first night in combat. And I said, Lord, there's nothing that I did in the Dominican Republic that was anything like this. I don't know if I can do another 364 days. But from that point on, our, our return to our base camp area was uneventful. But that night, we won the presidential unit citation at uh, Zulu LZ. And I think there's a, a movie that's been made of the first Air Cav when they got their presidential unit citation at LZ X-Ray. And the book is called we were soldiers once and young. So I was a soldier once. Mm -hmm. And in 1965, in 1965, at 22 years old, I was the platoon leader beginning yeah. my first tour in Vietnam. Close and what a first shape. night it was. Yeah. Welcome to Vietnam. Yes, sir. Welcome to Vietnam. Okay. Now that kind of sets the stage. Uh, we're, we're not dramatizing it, but uh, Hal's agreed, if he can, to give us a story as to what really went on so that the people who have read some of the bad press that was given to the guys coming back have a chance to maybe rethink some of the things to so what people really had to do and what the sacrifices they made. On that note, if you will, we talked about maybe giving a, a few examples of some of these patrols. What constituted a, a team, if you will, two, three, four, five guys? What was their makeup and what was each one responsible for doing? to make sure you went out, did your thing, and then came back. That's it's good, Bob. Job. So many times there's uh, all sorts of group movements. Sometimes we would go as a battalion, sometimes as a company, sometimes just as a platoon. Mine was, uh, I never had more than 45, 50 men. Sometimes just as a fire team, which would be five of us. So it made a difference what the mission was. That's what I wanted to know, yeah. I wanted, I wanted to share with you one of our missions because Sergeant Robinson is another one of those people that came into my life and he's just a part of my life forever. We, uh, we were the assault uh, platoon, uh, the first, first troops in to a hot LZ that had been prepared so that there was uh, airstrikes and artillery all around the opening that we went into. And uh, the first helicopter, which was in front of me, landed and discharged uh, a fire team, five, five young men. And the second helicopter started to pull away because they came under immediate fire. And the second helicopter was not going to land. So uh, I put my 45 to the helicopter pilot's head and said, you will uh, uh, get us close enough to the ground that we can jump out. And he said, yes, I will. And he brought us down and we jumped out and I got people up. You don't lay down. When you lay down, the enemy's been trained to shoot one foot yeah. off the ground. You lay down, you're going to catch it right in the face. You stand up, the worst you're going to do is end up with some shins or feet. So we get up and we charge that tree line. And I'll tell you, the, 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 the artillery came in and the shooting stopped and we got over the tree line and there's weapons that have been abandoned. So I'm doing a report back to headquarters and we've got the whole battalion come in and, and, and I'm figuring that all there was was just somebody must have been right there where we landed because the whole LZ wasn't hot. I look up and Sergeant Robinson's coming back across this landing zone out of the jungle and he's bare chested. He's only got jungle fatigues up to his waist. He has nothing on top of his body. Robinson, what's going on? Well, sir, wait just a minute. Coming out of the jungle is a young woman with his jungle fatigue on carrying a baby. So what's going on, Robinson? He says, well, sir, we found her at a, at a, in a tunnel underneath the hut, and uh, she was laying on top of her baby. And uh, this fellow right here coming out of the woods is a Viet Cong soldier. He was laying on top of her. He abandoned the weapons to go back, make sure his wife and his baby was okay. His wife? Yes, sir. Okay. So, <clears throat> Robinson took off his sweater, 
his, his jungle fatigue and gave it to her because it blew her clothes off. She was naked underneath that jungle shirt. I didn't think anything of it. Sixty days later, the man that came out with her is an interpreter for my battalion. Why? They had told him that American soldiers ate children, would rape your wives, would not give you a second chance. They came in, he took off his shirt, clothed my wife, picked up that baby, put me on a helicopter, we went back to Benoit, we got medical aid, we got, he said, I, 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 I need, yes. Turn the whole thing around, turn the whole thing around. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what a great man he turned to be. He probably learned uh, English faster than I learned uh, Vietnamese, but uh, I taught him the uh, Vietnamese national anthem. Ya con zanoi kup ya dang e ya pong, yang long hong di hi shin tiki tong shong. So he had the pride of the fact that here's somebody who cares about my family. Mm -hmm. and, and if there's anything that I could do to ever tell you about Sergeant Robinson, the compassion that the man had, but he was also a great soldier, decorated many times for those enemy that he neutralized, that he killed. Mm -hmm. And yet here was a man who said Compassion. she needs to be covered. Right. The child needs to be saved. The husband needs to go with his wife. It's a, so there's, there's a, 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 an That's assault. That's a humanitarian one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we, uh, we built schools. Uh, we handed out uh, vitamins. We handed out soap. Uh, one time, uh, we're uh, on a company operation, and we're approaching a village that is classified as friendly slash unfriendly. There was a period of time in which we were trying to neutralize the influence of the enemy around the country, and we would try to create friendly ha hamlets and mm -hmm. villages and provinces. A happy land. Yes. So this was friendly slash unfriendly. So I've crossed about the third dike of the rice paddy, and all of a sudden we're under Chinese communist equivalent of a 50 caliber machine gun fire, and we're down behind the dikes returning fire, and I've called for artillery. And the man at the fire direction center and artillery says, we cannot fire that. Uh, that's a friendly slash unfriendly village. I said, well, I'm going to hold up my uh, press to talk uh, microphone here and you listen to uh, how Which unfriendly is it is. Yeah. So uh, he said, I, I am not clear to give you artillery. Well, we, we were pinned down. There's no way we could move. So I knew that uh, the commanding general of the 173rd Airborne Brigade was big on commo security, which included thou shalt not swear. So I began to come up with every word I had ever heard and ever imagined over that radio, and all of a sudden, the commanding ooh, ooh, general's ooh. on there, and, and, uh, and he says, uh, you know, who is this? And I said, I'm sorry I didn't recognize your call sign. You're not on my net. Who's this? This is sort of blah, 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 blah. And you bet. I said, well, if you've got something you want to say to me, come and see me. And so all of a sudden, that helicopter's coming up over the palm trees, and as it comes down, six rounds go right through the front of that helicopter. It peels off, and I got my artillery. No. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We got back to, uh, we got back to base camp uh, after that operation was over, and the uh, commanding general called me down and said, I'd like you to be my, uh, my aide. Ooh. And I said, well, sir, uh, I, I was once taller than one other general, and I've got a picture of General Mark Clark and his expression when the photographer said, well, say something to the general, the uh, cadet, loosen up a little bit. And I looked at uh, General Clark and said, I've always wanted to be taller than a four-star general. And I said, his picture's uh, captured on that photograph. He said, sir, I don't, I don't, I don't think I want to be your aide. I'm a good foot taller than you are. He said, well, sir, you, uh, you showed a great deal of uh, ingenuity to get that fire support. And I said, yes, sir. And, and I'm committed to my soldiers. And uh, so I had to turn down the opportunity to be a, a general aide. Uh -huh. But there's a, a, another example of some of the things that happened. We had uh, rules of engagement that were extremely difficult, extremely can you, difficult. Can you tell us about them? You can't fly until you, you're shot at. Yes, sir. No way. We had a rule <clears throat> that only the point man, only the very first man in the line of movement could have a round of ammunition in his chamber because of accidental discharges. Now, I want you to know that every man in my outfit had, had a, a round in the chamber. Absolutely. And it wasn't unsafe. And uh, it, it just, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I did so many things that uh, 
sometimes we're a little controversial. Get back to uh, base camp. We were just done on a clearing patrol, a base camp outside of Benoit. Got back there, and uh, the battalion commander uh, sent uh, w one of uh, the orderlies up to tell me that there was a congressman that uh, wanted to see me. I said, a United States congressman? Yeah. yeah his, one of his uh, constituent's son is in your platoon. So he came up to see me, and we're inside this bermed area, and uh, he's, he's sort of in uh, some sort of a tropical suit, and uh, obviously it had to be very, very hot. And uh, he introduced himself, and I, I said, well, it's, it's nice to meet you, Congressman. And uh, uh, he said, well, I, I understand that you require your men to go to chapel when they're in base camp. I said, well, sir, you could read it that way. I said, over there is an orange A-frame house that uh, we all built. It looks like a Howard Johnson's to me. And uh, Chaplain McCullough, who's a Catholic priest, and uh, Connie Walker, who's a, who's a uh, Lutheran pastor, uh, both hold services there. But you'll notice next to it, there's a ping pong table, and there's a billiards table, and uh, there's also a, a, a subscription to Playboy magazine that Hugh Hefner had one of the uh, Playboy bunnies bring over to the battalion. I said, uh, I require them to spend some time in there. <laughs> and they, they can spend their time where the altar is, or they can spend their time with the ping pong table, or they can spend their time with the billboard. I just require them to do that. He said, well, uh, you, you can't do that. And uh, my constituent uh, says that uh, she wants a congressional investigation of your requir requirement that they attend church. Well, just then, uh, an alarm went off that there was a breach of security outside the perimeter. So we're on the immediate yeah, reaction I force. So I pushed him into the APC, and we headed out through the berm. And here he is in his suit, you know. And, and so all of a sudden, he likes this. I'm in the APC, and it's going, you know. And, and so he wants to put his head up over the no, APC. No, no. He's going to see what's going on. And, and, and we tripped one of those hand grenades that was on a little trip flare, and it blew up. And, and, and we, you know, he's sitting back down. And, Anyway, we got out there, and it was nothing. It was just somebody had come to check some taps on some uh, rubber trees on the other side of the rubber, pla rubber plantation, maybe a kilometer, a kilometer and a half from our perimeter. And so when we came back in, uh, he uh, said, there'll, there'll, be no, uh, there'll be no congressional investigation. Well, thank you, Congressman. I said, thank you so very much, Congressman. And uh, I, I hope, you have a, hope you have a good tour, and it's a yeah. little bit shorter than mine. But it's just, uh, you know, so many times we get a different opinion. Uh, I'm sad to say I was at a wedding back in the States, maybe, maybe only uh, 20 years ago, and there was a young man who said that he was the uh, non-commissioned officer aide to General Creighton Abrams, who I served under uh, in the MACV headquarters, my second tour. And uh, as he talked and told some stories, it was quite obvious he had never been at MACV headquarters, did not know where Cholon, the Chinese section of Vietnam was, and uh, it was all made up. And we had a chance to have a little bit of a break, and we were out in the parking lot, and I told him, I said, uh, I want you to stop talking. I, I know that you're phony. I will not expose you, but you will not tell any more uh, of your garbage yeah. about Vietnam. And uh, he uh, turned rather pale and said, all right. And so he was uh, quiet for the rest of the reception. But so many times there are things that are overblown, uh, things that are made up, things that are added to. Or taken out of context. Yes, sir, absolutely, or taken out of context. Absolutely. Yeah, they can say it's a verbatim quote, but they don't give you the four in the act. <laughs> yes, sir. I, I, I'd like to, uh, just because when, when we first talked on the phone, and, and what, what a pleasure it was to receive your phone call. It just was such a pleasure, Bob. Uh, I told you about uh, many, many times the enemy was uh, a victim of its lack of sophistication. Mm -hmm. But we also were many times the victims of our over-sophistication. On one Helleborn assault, we came into a rice paddy landing, and uh, as the lead chopper, again, I was in the second chopper, as the lead chopper s sat down, a conical hatted uh, Vietnamese uh, stood up with his AK-47 and shot into the rice paddy in front of him until he was out of ammunition, threw down his AK-47, and surrendered. What? So we, we did the whole Halliburton assault. There was nothing else happened. And uh, spent almost uh, 
two hours uh, interrogating him. Again, the interrogator, of course, was uh, our, our interpreter that we had saved earlier, oh, you know, who turned the... around, came around, because yeah. they, they only eat the babies and yeah. rape your wives. And uh, so he came back and he told me, he said, uh, you, you have to understand, like me, he is a South Vietnamese communist. He's Viet Cong. And the North Vietnamese were upset because his local unit hadn't shot down any helicopters. So they trained him to lead the helicopter by 300 meters or more. I said, oh, but that helicopter had stopped. He said, yeah, and he fired everything he had, 300. And, the, and, the, and he kept, because I kept watching, he's shooting and looking at the helicopter. Just seeing, you know. And he, just, <laughs> what? Why won't go down? <laughs> yes. Oh, Jack Roy. Tai Shao. Tai Shao. So uh, another time, another time we're uh, on an operation that's uh, been pretty uneventful. And, and sometimes uh, you didn't want it to be uneventful. It was just hot. You were tired. You walked all day. Sweated, leeches, bugs, you know, just, just sometimes when there wasn't a problem, it was bad because you started getting sloppy. Well, that night. Distract. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. That night we get a call confirmed <clears throat> by side looking angular radar and a people sniffer. Now, a people sniffer sniffs pneumonia. We can confirm the largest Vietnamese military outfit in the opening about three kilometers from you. That's the middle of the night. There is no moon. It is a starless night. We're going to have to go nearly two kilometers in the jungle. But we're going to go circle this because they've seen an enemy in, in the open in this clearing two kilometers away. By seeing you mean they detected? Oh, yes, detected. Yes, sir. Side-looking angular radar, they've detected the movement. Okay. With the, with the smell of the, of, of the um, what did I say that was? Ammonia. With the smell of the ammonia, they've confirmed that it's, it's, it might be as much as, as a company, maybe even a battalion. So we're moving our company, but we're going to surprise it. We'll circle this opening. Oh, very laborious going through the jungle. Extremely difficult during the day and at night. Uh, uh, unbelievable. Oh, let me stop you right there. Yes, One question it keeps coming back to mind. As you're going through the buffalo grass and what have you, do you have any problems like snakes that you have to watch out for? Because I had a lot of guys come back and say, the two steppers, you're gone. Well, we, we, yes, we did. And um, many, many times the point man is, is the man that's the key to the whole operation. So he knows what to look for. Now, in elephant grass, <laughs> all the pests have the advantage. Mm -hmm. But in the jungle, you, you can tell. It's just like when you go hunting. You, you can tell where the deer's track is. Okay. So uh, you, you get so you, you don't smoke cigarettes because there's nothing that smells like a cigarette in the jungle. Amen. You know, you don't, uh, you, you don't make, uh, you, you don't play your Walkman. You don't, you, you know, <laughs> you're quiet. And so many times uh, you, can, you can stop and you'll be surrounded by sound, the jungles. Mm -hmm. and if the sound stops, you know in and that quadrant something. there's something there. Yeah. So one time, we, 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 there's, there's something out there in the left front. And the point man's got us so that we've all maneuvered, so we've, we're going to react to something. That, and all of a sudden, it sounds like we've got vehicles coming through, the, coming through the, the forest, coming through the jungle. I mean, there's crashing and everything. It turns out to be one male ape chasing two female apes across the oh, trees. Two to one, that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. But uh, so many times there, there would be uh, uh, snakes. Uh, uh, the, the thing that, uh, that, that used to drive us all crazy wasn't so much the pests as it was a thing that we called bamboo poisoning. It was like an impetigo. And, and, you know, you're out there, and there's no chance to, uh, to wash. There's no chance. It's hot. You're muggy. And, and when we get back to base camp, the uniform would be uh, cutoffs, Bermuda shorts and no shirt, so that the sun would have a chance to, to heal the, the, the bamboo poisoning, almost like uh, impetigo. I don't know oh. if you remember impetigo as a, as a child, you know, those things, and they'd take, take, get the scabs to come off. It would awful, almost look like a leper. I missed something, I guess. <laughs> But uh, so so anyway, we're going through the uh, we're going yeah. through the jungle late at night, um, and and we are actually circling almost almost have encircled 
this open area, and I hear one of my soldiers laughing. I say, he's going to blow the entire thing. I hear, and then I hear laughter again and again and again. Same guy or going down the oh, line? Oh, going right down the line, yeah, right around that entire opening. We had surrounded the largest herd of water buffalo oh. we had ever encountered in Vietnam. So we spent the rest of the day loading them onto Chinooks. Now it is hard to get a water buffalo to walk onto a Chinook helicopter. Not to get but, a water <laughs> buffalo, period. <laughs> but it was the largest herd we'd ever, but, but there again, there was, there was certainly an awful, an, an awful smell. Yeah. And there certainly was the side-looking angular radar, and they could see those bodies moving, and they could, they could see the, the, the heat, and they thought the heat was, was maybe campfires. or <laughs> I, I never saw the Viet Cong do any of that stuff anyway. <laughs> well, it wasn't that so. A lot of it, uh, you had to know which way the wind was blowing so that you could know that you, uh, this is coming from them rather than going towards them. Oh, yes, sir. That Absolutely. Sound like the birds stopped singing all of a sudden. Yes, sir. And many, many times that's the way we would do... Uh, uh, Hasty ambushes, because yeah. we'd listen. We'd be so quiet. You wanted the, the 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 noise discipline was determined by if you were circled by the noise of the jungle. If you were circled by the noise of the jungle, you knew that your noise discipline was good. Yeah. And as you approached the, the, their little camps, you could smell the dried fish. That is, in, unless of course you're like one of uh, one of the outfits that we worked with, where they had no discipline at all. They, they'd smoke cool cigarettes. There's nothing like a mentholated. Cigarette. I, I could smell a mentholated cigarette 200, 250 meters away. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I want to tell you one, one more story. This is about uh, Jimmy Mosden from uh, Claremont. Jimmy Mosden's no longer with us. He uh, died of bone cancer. He, he thinks it was from Agent Orange. Jimmy Mosden was uh, a platoon leader with us and uh, good, with a, good with a map. And we're up in the Central Highlands. There's 44 provinces in Vietnam. I think I walked in 42 of them. And uh, we're in the Central Highlands, and everywhere you look, there's, there's, there's rolling mountains. It's almost like they took large intestines laying next to one another. And Captain Tom Faley, our company commander, wants to know which one of those mountains we're on. Well, I, I'm pretty good with uh, contour map. I, I, I figure we're on this hill here. Uh, Jimmy Mosden figures we're on that hill there. There's a young fellow named Jones who just joined us, and he thinks we're at this hill up there. We, we knew he wasn't right because as point man, he circled back through us one time. He, he just he couldn't follow a compass at all. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, so we said, well, well, we'll throw smoke, and we'll have a helicopter locate the smoke. So we threw the smoke, and helicopter says, I identify yellow smoke. Yeah. Well, where are we? They had a fourth location. The Tom Faley says, I don't, I don't like this. Uh, we're going to try another one. Get the uh, forward air controller for the Air Force, for our air support. This was uh, a guy from artillery. We'll, we'll throw another smoke. You know, I'm, I'm uh, throwing smoke. I'll identify violet smoke. Where are we? He comes up with a sixth mountain top. So we've got six different mountains we're supposed to be on, six Everybody different knew hills. exactly where they were. Yes. <laughs> we know we're in Vietnam. Where in Vietnam, we haven't the slightest idea. So Tom Faley, the company commander, says, see, I think you guys are all wrong. I'm sure we're right here. He puts his finger right there. He says, I'm so sure we're right there. I want, I want a company perimeter. I, the closest person I want to this point right here, the closest person I want there is 50 meters from here. Now let's have a company perimeter. So in about uh, an hour, we have a company perimeter. Which means and he what? Calls, yes, sir. Circle okay. that area. And the closest person to that spot where he put his finger, 50 meters away. He calls in a fire mission for one round of white phosphorus. It's coming, and I said, oh, it's like my first night. It's going to come right on it, and it landed right where Tom Faley said. Wow. <laughs> I'm glad it was white phosphorus doesn't have the, the impact of high explosive. It's, it's really a smoke producer, and, uh, but, but he knew where we were. So the story about uh, Tommy Mosden is the next morning. We're in this company perimeter. And uh, Sergeant Robinson, I already told you about Sergeant Robinson, has uh, gone out in front of the perimeter because he's going to uh, do some eliminate. He's going to do some uh, morning ablution. Yeah. Yes, and he's dug a little, uh, little hole and he'll cover it up. And all of a sudden, there's firing. And he takes a bullet right across the top of his head. He's got a permanent part in his head. So I see him go down. I went running out. 
grabbed him. He hung onto my neck. We're crawling back into the perimeter. And, and coming right behind us is an assault on that part of the perimeter. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm watching as a, as a Viet Cong stands up. I could have shot him, and I didn't. And then he disappeared. And, and it looks like they're going to get into that part of the perimeter. And Moose, Jimmy Mosden, his, his, his nickname is Moose, West Point graduate. Jimmy Mosden is the only paratrooper alive on that part of that perimeter. And so I'm calling in the artillery, and we've dropped it 25 meters. We've dropped it again. And then all of a sudden, Jimmy Mosden, shooting them out of the trees, shooting them out of the whatever. And I, you know, I just, it's all over. I'm going to put Jim Mosden in for the Silver Star. He stayed, he was the only man alive out there. He never came back. He, he stayed in his brown shelter and, and kept them from overrunning us yeah, on that part of the perimeter. He was a point of fire. Unbelievable. <clears throat> well, now, before we had started, we had just started a, a, a new kind of thing in the battalion called a company coin. And so every one of us got a company coin. And you could challenge. I could say, Bob, have you got your coin? And if you didn't have it, you'd buy me a drink when we got back to base camp. If you did have it, I'd buy you one because I didn't trust you to have your coin. Now, I'll tell you, I am so frightened still. I can't stand up. My knees are shaking. It was just, it was, in fact, July 3rd. It was just, my, my knees were shaking. I couldn't even stand up. And I'm yelling at, at, at Mosden. Moose, are you okay? Hey, have you got your coin? Greatest thing that ever happened. Have you got your coin? Yeah. In the midst of all of this, Moose Mosden. And he got the Silver Star for his actions that day. And uh, he wasn't going to accept it. And I told him that uh, those uh, fellows in his platoon who survived that day wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't follow him if he didn't accept that silver star. So he got that silver star that day, Jimmy Mosden. Mm. Just, a, just a neat guy. It was just, uh, there's another fellow who was, uh, that day did the fire mission of the, uh, the artillery. Uh, and his name was Tom Dooley, another West Point graduate. It really was. Hang down your head, Tom hang down, Dooley. Yeah. yeah, hang down your head, Tom Dooley. We had a Another fellow in our battalion whose name was uh, William Dollar, Dollar Bill. <clears throat> and uh, one day we went out on an operation and uh, we made it into the uh, assault. And it was uh, a hot LZ, but we, we, we got in without anyone getting killed in action. And uh, Bill Dollar uh, fell down crying and uh, just shaking. And uh, so they sent him back to battalion aid station. And uh, there were some new replacements, like I had been four months earlier, who said, uh, the man's uh, a chicken. I said, no, sir, he's not. He's, he's been some, some incredible operations. Yeah. Two months later, he gets the Distinguished Service Cross for heroism. But there's, there's a time sometimes when you just, you're at your breaking point. Yeah. I used to have... Uh, a nightmare that I was on an ambush patrol and uh, my snoring had uh, given away our precision. And the first time I dreamed that dream, I woke up and I was on an ambush patrol and I had given away our position. And we got back to the uh, States after two tours and sometimes I'd have that dream and I'd wake up in the middle of the night sweating and worrying and uh, I'd notice I was in a warm bed with clean sheets and a toilet that flushed and hot, cold running water. And there's, there's no reason to worry about that anymore. So that uh, dream's gone away. But there's, you there's times. You can't leave it all. Nope. You, you, there, there's just, uh, there's some things that you don't, uh, you don't forget. And uh, you learn to live with. And I think that's why what you do, Bob Stevens, is so important that men can share their stories with another man. You're a CV. You've been there. You're, you're a brother in arms. And, uh, but I wouldn't jump out of an airplane. <laughs> no, sir, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't today for $110. No, sir. No, sir. Now, I, I don't know if there's some other things here. There were other things here that I wanted to make sure that make I... Make uh, sure that this is your show, my boy. Oh, boy, I just, uh, you know... Yeah, I, make it easy on you. We've got six minutes to go. Or six, oh, isn't that good? Isn't that good? Huh. One more. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay. 
My second tour in Vietnam, I was in counterintelligence, and uh, I was a recovery officer, and we did uh, uh, prisoner of war recovery missions. And uh, we had an R&R, &R and I went to Hawaii. And I was leaving from Hawaii. I had my khaki shirts on, my blouse boots, and, you know, all my, all my decorations, all this sort of thing, and a cast on my arm. And a little old lady with a cane came by and thanked me for my service. And she said, were you wounded? And uh, I lied to her. I said, yes, I was. I had broken my wrist playing volleyball in the parking lot of the <laughs> MACB headquarters. I felt so terrible. I really did. I really did. You had asked me to explain yes, this. Uh, I'd like to go through the fruit salads. Okay. Can you get a good, clear shot of this, folks? Uh, these don't just get handed out. First of all, this is the 173rd Airborne Brigade Separates patch. Uh, it's on my right sleeve because that was my uh, combat unit. And this is the Presidential Unit Citation. We learned my first, uh, we earned my first night in combat. Uh, the U.S. is the United States. The crossed rifles are for uh, infantrymen. Again, mm -hmm. remember my job was to uh, be the prime mover of a rifle. This is the combat infantryman's badge. You'll notice the wreath around it means that I've been in combat, and the star is I've been in combat twice. So the star is for uh, the second time in Vietnam. The wreath is for the first time in the Dominican Republic. Sometimes you'll see a, a, a blue infantryman's badge without the wreath. That means he's an expert infantryman. As we go down through the decorations, the first one you'll notice there's a V. The V is for valor, and the oak leaf is because there's a second award. So this is a bronze star with V and an oak leaf cluster, followed by the Army Commendation Medal with a V and an oak leaf cluster, followed by a purple heart and an oak leaf cluster. The first purple heart that I received, uh, I told you the story about that very first night in combat my first tour in Vietnam. I'll uh, not, not go into the second one. This is the Joint Services Commendation Medal, the National Defense Service Medal, the Army Expeditionary Forces Medal, the Vietnamese Service Medal with three campaign stars, and the Vietnamese Campaign Ribbon. And this is my jump wings. All the paratroopers end up with uh, novice jump wings, and that was for jumping out of a perfectly good airplane with my eyes closed and my pants wet. So, uh, and this was the last unit I served with in Vietnam, uh, which was MACV, MACV headquarters with uh, Great Name Rooms and the Counterintelligence Directorate. So that's the, uh, and the reason why I brought this in, Bob, is, is the Class A uniform is, is being uh, uh, discontinued. And so there's going to be a time when uh, people are, uh, 71 or 90 as you are, that uh, th these uniforms well, won't be around yeah, anymore. I know. And they've already changed this. They already wear a beret. This is what yeah. uh, the paratroopers used to wear from World War II, a glider patch. My first outfit, the 325th Infantry, was a glider a glider outfit. This is a glider here, and then the, the parachute is... No, explain that, please. That's a new Oh, one. World War II. They didn't have enough planes, so when they did the assault... They put them in a glider, no engine, and they just tow oh, it. That, okay, I've, I've heard stories about that, but I didn't know that you, you had one of these. Yep, yeah, yeah, it was actually right on the, on the uh, airborne patch. So okay. airborne outfits were either airborne with parachutes or airborne with the, with the gliders. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's what I brought. And, and I want to thank you so very, very much for, uh, for your service. Oh. I, uh, I am in awe of all of you that served in World War II, when our country was uh, nearly 100% behind you. That's and, the uh, difference. I envy it, that day. And, and if you will, <laughs> I'll get off my soapbox. But one of the things I'm finding out, a lot of the things the guys have shared with me, and I've hopefully got the records of it, is that uh, everybody had a job to do, but they didn't know specifically sometimes what they had to do. But we did it. The whole country back in World War II, everybody was in the act. I know the biggest complaint I had, silly as it may sound, when my brother and I enlisted way back when in 43, we had a big box that ivory soap came in, these yes, blue boxes. And we loaded comic books, uh, old cast iron toys, what have you, marbles. And we said, okay, we put that up in the attic. When we come back, Mom, we'll talk about it. Uh, when we came back and finally got around to getting the box out of the attic, I looked around and I couldn't find the box. Mm -hmm. And we looked and we looked and said, hey, Mom, what about the box that Kitty and I put up in the attic? We had a lot of good stuff. 
very proud. He says, I gave that to the war drive when they came by looking for stuff like paper and that. I said, you didn't throw away my two copies of the first issue of Superman Comics. That may have been in the pack body. Why? <laughs> uh, that's when my mother and I, we almost parted ways. <laughs> but everybody was in the act. Yes, sir. Unfortunately, as wars have gotten better, if that's possible, we have fractions. People don't recognize that what has been given them the right to object to is what people have had to pay a hell of a price to get. Yes, sir. And it, well, the old bit, freedom isn't free. It's not a saying. It's a statement of fact. Well, all I can say is I thank you for your thank service. Thank you very much. Yes, and sir. getting to meet you. We're going to have some fun later on, buddy. Thank okay. you, sir. Amen. That's a wrap, folks. We have a minute or two left. But what I'd like to say, in effect, as I said at the beginning, I'm new to the area. I've been doing this for a while. I enjoy doing it. But more important, I want to make sure that every guy and gal, and if you know somebody who you think may be interested, give them my name. Uh, it won't make them rich, but if we can and have them come and do a show with us, it'll be one more, if you will, plug for the good team. The name is Bob Stevens. The address is on the back. All I can say is please, if you can and will, come and share us. I'm here to do whatever I can, particularly you guys from Nam and Korea. I'm not hanging crepe, but you're like the rest of us old guys. You're starting to die off, and I don't want people to miss the story. So please, if you can and will, come and talk to us. Again, thank you. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.